Well, lots of finger, play, uh, finger pointing going on last week after the midterms failed to produce a red wave. So who's really to blame? Is it Donald Trump and time for us to move on? Or is it Mitch McConnell, who from behind the scenes failed to get out enough money in these uh, key elections where people like Blake, Blake Masters and others failed to get across the finish line in winnable races? Let's talk to somebody who knows best. That's Tho Bishop. He is the communications director for the Mises Institute, and he's joining us on the line right now. Good morning, Tho. Thank you for taking your time with us today. Ah, thank you for having me, Austin. Yeah, we were having this conversation on Twitter yesterday. I thought it would be worthy of a segment this morning on the morning show. Uh, the question of who's really to blame for people like Blake Masters not getting across the finish line. And you kind of you know, have feet in both camps here. Mitch McConnell didn't spend enough and Donald Trump didn't do enough. Do you want to make your case? Yeah, I think first and foremost, you know, we have to recognize that we just have a profound leadership problem uh, in the GOP and, and really just amongst sane people in American politics right now. Um, I'm someone who has been a, a Trump fan, you know, since 2016. I think that the Trump revolution was great. Um, and that was an example of, I think, American Republicans were desperate for new leadership and wanted Donald Trump to fill that void. Um, the problem is, is that we got a situation where Donald Trump didn't spend money that he got for his people. Right. You know, he he, he was doing uh, a donation drives where one dollar went to Blake Masters for ninety nine going to Donald Trump. Um, if you want to be a leader of the party, you've got to spin and put your people in power. Um, but Mitch McConnell certainly is to blame, spending more money on attacking Republicans in Alaska than you know, getting Blake Masters to the finish line in Arizona. Kevin McCarthy, you know, has been a complete disappointment, you know, really his entire congressional career. Um, the priorities, again, it doesn't matter if it's MAGA camp or establishment Republicans, all of them deserve the loss here. And it's really a, a troubling time right now. If you're just tuning in, we're speaking to Tho Bishop. He's the communications director for the Mises Institute. Now, in one of the the finger pointing, the fingers are pointing out is the whole the candidates who believed in the 2020 stolen election theme turned off the independents. Do you buy that? Uh, per, perhaps to a certain extent. I mean, I, it's something that I assumed going into this election. My, my kind of working analysis was that normal people kind of are are, are underappreciated in politics, right? And so normal people are you know they'll, they'll have inconsistent views right you know they, they, they don't want their taxes raised but they want government to keep their hands off the medicare and medicaid um and i guess just kind of assume that going into this any any turnoff they had maybe about some of the the later trump stuff the way the media has presented things you know all the the democratic hysteria over january 6 that was always going to take a back bench to you know gasoline prices and the, the cost of steak and eggs going up but if you look around, I mean, even though nationally, right, the, the turnout for Republicans was significantly higher than Democrats broadly um, on these key races, you know, the, the results are what they are. And, and you know, there's something to be said. I, I think a big part of this is Republicans still have not caught up to the changes in the way that elections are conducted. Right. I'm not talking about, you know, the crack in and, and voting machines changing tabulations after the word after the fact. There's something to be said about Democrats having vastly overperformed in increases in vote by mail balloting, um, again, some of these fundamentals on how elections are changed. And I, I think that perhaps is a bigger thing than turnoffs to independents generally. Um, but the same thing, though, is complaining about it after the fact isn't good enough, right? I mean, we, we're, we're dealing with a, a very sick and, and twisted left right now doing everything they can to you know, subject us to, to anti-human very dangerous policies. And again, if, if, if we don't have an answer to that on the right to stop them, um, then we deserve everything that's coming. We, we need serious people handling these things. And you know, what 2022 has shown is that we simply do not have that serious people up top. If you're just tuning in, we're speaking to Tho Bishop, communications director for the Mises Institute, about what went wrong in the elections last week for Republicans. Now, the uh, a lot of the finger point, pointing that's going on right now is Donald Trump blaming, you know, Ron DeSantis for, you know, for this. And I know that you're a DeSantis Republican. It says so in your Twitter uh, profile. What do you make of uh, the attacks that Donald Trump has brought, you know, the broadsides he's launching against uh, your boy, DeSantis? Yeah, I'm, I'm not surprised. Um, I, I hate to see it. I, I, I feel you, I think this is the first time really since 2016 where, where Don, Donald Trump sees a, a genuine rival for the stage. And in particular with the DeSantis, it's someone who is not an establishment guy, really, my, by my definition. He's someone who has a unique record where he can almost out MAGA Trump in many ways. Right. You know, when he was in you know, the, the, 
everything that he did in COVID, he often had to do um, forcing a more traditional Republican legislature to do what he wanted them to do. You know, he, he stood up not only to, to D.C., but to corporate power, trying to become the enforcement wing of Fauciism. And so the specific accomplishments of DeSantis, I think, really threatened Trump's old hold over, let's say, the MAGA movement. And so I, I'm not surprised that, that Trump is lashing out. I hate to see it in, in my ideal world of worlds. You know, I would have much rather had, you know, four more years of Trump and, you know, four years of DeSantis really leveraging every single thing he could get from his governor's position. And then, you know, ideally go into eight years of, of DeSantis afterwards, <laughs> given the results of 2022, given Trump's reactions to it, given the turnoff that his attacks on, Donald, uh, on DeSantis are having, even amongst you know, friends, you know, pe people here in Bay County where, where I'm active in my Republican Party, this is a very MAGA club. Um, they're, they're not liking what Donald is saying right now. And so I'm, I'm not surprised by it with the egos involved. And it is what it is. And again, I, I have tremendous respect for, for what Donald Trump did, you know, the, the energy he infused in this movement. Um, but it's, it's a bad look right now. He's, he's hurting himself, you know, right now. And again, I, you know, the, the attacks that are going to start coming to DeSantis are a part of the game. I, I, I trust that he's going to be able to handle it well. Um, get trying to, to make him out to be some sort of, you know, Kevin McCarthy plot against MAGA while, you know, you have Donald Trump out there trying to, to double down on Kevin McCarthy as speaker. You know, it's a little funny in its own right. Um, but I, I'm not surprised, but it is disappointing to see. Uh, we're speaking to Tho Bishop, communications director for the Mises Institute, about the uh, midterm elections. One last question uh, regarding, you know, uh, surrounding the midterms. Over the weekend, the senator from Missouri, Josh Hawley, tweeted that the old Republican Party is dead and that it's time for us to create a new Republican Party that it appeals to the massive amount of independence that the Republicans lost last week. I guess my question is, I mean, even though like I agree with that on its face, though, is how do you create a new Republican Party that's appealing to independence that still holds to the ideals of the MAGA movement, knowing that to some extent, some of the, you know, like the election fraud narrative of the MAGA movement is what I would, you know, interpret as a millstone sort of holding it back. So what would a new Republican Party be? And, you know, could people like yourself and myself who are more libertarian Republicans have a, a place in it? I believe so. I think intellectually, the the project that really kind of represents what, what Holly's talking about and, and really, I think, kind of defines DeSantis' intellectual worldview, which I think will become increasingly important on the right, is a sort of burgeoning national conservatism movement. And it, 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 that, I think, is, is a more broad coalition where you have people with particularly on some economic issues, um, you know, there, there's a lot of, of, of interest in uh, uh, you know, explicit protectionism, things like that, which which I do not like. Um, but on the other side, there's increased skepticism of the administrative state, um, kind of recognition that politics of old, the, the politics of the 20th century has been a disaster for the American cause, which I think is right into kind of a libertarian viewpoint of American history. The issue is, though, is that it, it's one thing to talk about these things and to gripe. Again, you know, I, it's one thing to acknowledge that there are aspects of the 2020 election that were wrong, that 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 democracy was was weaponized. You know, again, we could look at again changes to the way elections were conducted in 2020, the way that big tech um, had a cartel censoring you know, important information, which you can't have in a democracy, right? When when information that would change the people the way that people would vote were coordinatedly censored, like the Hunter Biden laptop, that is a major issue. But but we can't simply complain about it. We need solutions, and I, I think what Holly is pointing at is that the Republican Party right now simply isn't serious enough about the things they claim to care about. And I, I think this is true with Trump. I think this is true with McConnell. I think this is true with McCarthy. I think this is true with Ronna, Ronna Romney McDaniels. And again, you know, hopefully, if there's any silver lining that comes to this, it's that we have a complete changeover in the, the true leadership. And we have you know, people of, of real merit, of, of really serious people, even if, even if serious people I may disagree with on very important issues, we just need serious people right now um, to really build a coalition that can stop, again, some of the very evil things that are coming from the left. Yeah, and if I can, you know, briefly interject my own point of view on this one, despite the fact that I think that the Republicans losing largely last week uh, is harmful to our country, it's harmful to our economy, and it's, it's you know, harmful to, you know, many aspects of our society culturally. The one bright spot in this might be that the chaos offers people who are of our intellectual ilk or our philosophical mindset an opportunity to sort of rise where there's chaos, right? There's opportunity. 
right? Where there's crisis, there's opportunity, mm -hmm. right? So now is a very good time for people who believe what we believe to rise up and to establish ourselves in positions of power within the Republican Party so that, you know, if a new party is created, as we're discussing here, that people who believe what we believe that, right, that might, you know, have, you know, anti-elitist views on the bureaucratic state or the deep state or the administrative state, whatever you want to call it, that, that you know, that we can work with them on those issues while still sort of like, you know, throwing elbows whenever they want to come in with, you know, protectionist trade policy or some other kind of, you know, um, you know, central planning style solution that, you know, comes along with the more Theodore Roosevelt wing of the Republican Party. Uh, but I'd like to move on, though. Um, uh, if I've got a couple of minutes left, left here. I'd like to ask you about the whole Sam Bankman fried controversy. <laughs> We're going to talk about this later in the show. I mean, you know, without making it too, um, you know, minor of a topic here, it's already being blamed on libertarians, right, for uh, this massive collapse of a crypto exchange. This Sam Bankman fried character, uh, big Democratic donor. I mean, I guess the second biggest Democratic donor behind George Soros. Something's mm -hmm. fishy here. What do you think is the big takeaway from this story? What are you really focusing in on? And do you think is the most important thing to know about this? Well, FTX seems kind of like a, a perfect storm on like, you know, it's it's, it's a combination of like a, a really bad Ayn Rand villain with sort of a modern uh, aesthetics, right? If you look at the guy um, and, and really what, what 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 this is all about is, I mean, FTX was trying to utilize you know, the SEC, the regulatory state to really hold itself up as the de facto crypto exchange, um, which you know, if you talk to, you know, kind of the hardcore, you know, Bitcoin purist, right? They would say like, well, an institution like FTX is precisely what Bitcoin was meant to fix, right? You know, it, it, Bitcoin was meant to decentralize the financial system to allow for true peer-to-peer -peer exchanges where something like an FTX becomes a centralized, regula regulatory, you know, regulated uh, financial institution. And, and sure enough, right, you know, this, you know, now we've got a good old-fashioned bank run um, happening in crypto, right? So FTX, the more that it resembled old financial institutions, that precisely is what created sort of its downfall here. Um, and, and then again, you know, the, the, everything that, that Sam Bankman fried tried to do instead of presenting himself as, you know, the billionaire that cares, he just wants to give everything back, right? Um, of course, you know, this is typically always a front for very nefarious, you know, behind the scenes things. Um, the, 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 the political aspect, is, you know, is, it just adds a whole other layer here. I have a feeling if it was a Republican donor response, if this was Peter Thiel, um, that was walking away, with ran away with billions of customer funds, the way the media would treat this. It'd be a little bit different than if it was Sam Bankman fried. Um, but again, the, the libertarian criticism, you know, it's, it's always funny because, you know, in the libertarian space, we can't seem to get anything right. Uh, and yet we are blamed for, you know, all the woes of civilization. Uh, you know, just just another day in, in, in our, our little crazy world. <laughs> can't win elections, can change the outcome, uh, you know, can't take power, but very powerful enough to destroy empires. Uh, that's Tho Bishop, the communications director for the Mises Institute. Tho, great conversation, great interview. We hope to have you back. Thank you for your time today. Thank you for having me, Austin. Thank you very much. What did you think of Tho Bishop? Send us a text.